do agree with Michael on quite a lot of things. I really agree. You're right. I really agree that we need reform. But the, the extent and the scope of that reform and the direction of that reform, I take a completely different position on. So from my position, I agree with Michael we've got problems with schoolification in early childhood. I agree we've got problems losing out on the interpersonal. But I disagree that the four C's are new. And I believe that if we focus on building capacity in teacher education, uh, we will be able to maintain the sorts of creativity and collaboration and all those uh, new so-called new century skills that many teachers over decades past have been imparting to their students through deep and sensitive relationship building. But here's the thing. Apart from being interested in children's emotional development, I am a statistician. I'm a mother and a teacher, but I'm a self-confessed stats geek. And my husband's deeply worried that I'm here to bore you. Um, to begin with, to answer the question, I want to know what is needed for the reform. Are we talking about an improvement project where we take what's already a good education system and we are still performing relatively well and then we improve it by adding these new skills, the four C's and new perspectives, everything that learning science and psychology has taught us is good about, about education and we apply that. Is that what we want from reform? I wish. In fact, I think what's needed is the second option here. We have a repair project that is needed. We have at the moment a system where urgent action is needed to stem very evident declines in most of the statistical indicators in education. So hold on to your hats, I'm going to rip through some of them. I might start by saying that I'm really a little bit envious of Michael. His talk here was not a barbecue stopper. People at barbecues in Australia like to talk about four C's and the future of learning. It's very interesting. But think of my case. Oh, I'm so interested in the education statistics. Yes, those declines. It is the ultimate barbecue stopper, except for perhaps this one by Tony. I have stood at barbecues, many of them, uh, in the inner west, I'm an inner westie, and I'm often there with some nice, very well-intentioned, quite well-educated parents. Some of, them, some of them have been heading off to the UK and they're deeply concerned. They say to me, oh, you're an education specialist. Oh, you know we're going to the UK for 12 months, so I'm deeply worried about the standard of the schools there. And I go, oh, well, I would have been worried 20 years ago, but now I'd be rejoicing. In fact, the tables have turned on Australian education in oh so many ways since I returned from the UK around 2000. Let's look, oh, here's the ultimate barbecue stopper, by the way. I had to stick it in. Tony, um, Tony wins. It trumps the educational statistics when you, when you tell them the story about giving Prince Philip a knighthood. <laughs> These are the headlines. There are some headlines in education, although to be frank, reviewing the statistics, I'm surprised why there aren't more. And I was deeply surprised during the last election cycle to notice we didn't have any front page news on education. You will understand that perspective at the end of this talk. But for quite a few years now, we've been learning of the declines in the, in the performance of Australian students. We've been learning not only are they declining in maths, reading and science, but also in financial literacy. Eventually those declines, in fact quite recently, managed to raise a comment from the Federal Education Minister, Birmingham, who is now deeply concerned. A former state minister also expressed concern and position some of the blame for these declines on parents and parental expectations of schooling being too high. 
it was always going to happen that sooner or later people were going to start saying there's a problem with teaching. And I believe there is, but it may not be as simple as what's in the headline. The OEC Director of Education came to Australia and gave us a warning. In fact, he's been doing that for many years now. He looked over the Australian performance on the international assessment and said, oh, your students are doing best on the rote learning questions. That might be explaining your decline. <laughs> and finally, we got a great educational expert in to tell us what was really going on. In fact, we were all just suffering from a bunch of fads. Uh, the technical term was daffy trends. And that was the problem with education. But let's have a deeper look and see what's going on. I'm going to go through six reasons why Australian education is failing its students. And this is also available on the conversation. It's quite an old article now, but it still rings true. That's nothing has changed. First of all, Australian teens are falling behind as others race ahead. These are our neighbours, Singapore. They are now currently ranked first and the highest performing students on the globe. Uh, our other Asian neighbours are in similar positions. Taiwan is very highly placed. Japan, Korea are also performing very well on numeracy tests, reading and on scientific literacy. The gap between those countries and the Australian performance is equivalent to two and sometimes two and a half years of schooling. Over the period, um, there have been some declines in Australia's real scores, which I will show you in a minute. But what's important to notice here is that in mathematics in particular, we are actually very close to the OECD average now. When this test was first introduced in 2000, we were ranked four, and we were a very high-performing system. The rankings headlines, which always grab attention, are not the real story. The real story is when you look at the data, Australian students are now learning, or, or certainly answering, fewer questions correctly on a test than those who went through and did that in the year 2000. Here, the declines in numeracy, reading, and science literacy are equivalent to more than six months of schooling. So if I took a student who had done those tests in 2000 and one who had done them in 2015, the one in 2015 had the advantage of six months more of schooling. They are very real and steep declines. Not only that, these declines have occurred across all Australian jurisdictions. You can see, obviously, some states are declining more than others. Uh, Northern Territory is performing particularly badly. However, the trends are very similar across states, across school sectors. They are the same across uh, public, independent and Catholic schools, and they're the same across different socioeconomic demographics. When we control for the demographics, as we do in this graph, you can see the same declines. But we can't rely on PISA for everything because it is also correlated with ice cream consumption, right? We've got to look at other data. And in fact, that is one of the problems we have with PISA now. It has garnered so much attention internationally, perhaps not in Australian media, but internationally, it's garnered so much attention, people are forgetting about the other statistics. So I'm going to move on now and show you some other statistics which I find actually more concerning than these performance statistics. First of all, in Australia, we have declining participation in mathematics and science. What does that mean? We have proportionately fewer students studying maths and science for high school graduation in 2018 or 17 than we did in 1990. And this is in the era of STEM education, scientific innovation, 21st century skills, and all the sophistication that is required of that. Here are the national statistics. You can see 
there is one incline on this graph. The top row is the entry level mathematics and it is going up directly proportional to the line below it which is going down. That is intermediate level mathematics. So some highly able students are changing from intermediate mathematics, the old two unit course, over to the entry level. That is the only growth area in science and maths nationally. In fact, the proportions doing all of the other sciences have declined, and some of them precipitously. I'm particularly surprised about the green line down the bottom, which is those students studying geology. And there's not even a blip for that mining boom. <laughs> I mean, we are talking very, very low percentage of students in Australia graduating high school prepared to go on and study geology at university. And the university geology courses are in a similarly dire position. Most of them have closed over the last 10 years. So these declines in participation rates are not often talked about because in a developed country and a developed world, we think all of that is just dealt with. There is an assumption that kids are learning science and they're learning maths, that's fine. But here in Australia, some neglect of policy detail appears to have led to these results. Fewer than one in 10 Australian high school graduates studies advanced maths. Over the last decade, there has been what could only be described as a collapse in girls' participation in maths and science. In New South Wales, for example, or nationally, only 6% only, uh, of girls go for ma advanced maths. If you've got a daughter doing advanced maths, like three or four unit, they are an elite student. And in New South Wales, only a tiny 1.5% of girls take advanced maths, physics, chemistry. If you make your daughter or granddaughter study that combination, she will be prepared for the elite entry courses at university. Even if she doesn't perform well within her cohort, She's in such a small cohort now. Maths is not a requirement at senior secondary school in Australia. There is no national policy on that. Birmingham actually tried to put a proposal forward to COAGS um, about a year and a half ago, which was slammed down immediately um, by Labor state governments in opposition to him. This makes us an extremely uh, outlying position internationally. Almost no developed countries have a high school graduate program, high school graduation program with, that does not require maths. And it means that all of the students who are now going through to university not only are, are victims of the decline in education system which has led to those attainment declines we just looked at, but also less prepared on science and maths curriculum. Australian education is essentially monolingual. If you look at the participation rates for languages, they are at a, an historic low. Roughly across the country, there are about 8% of high school students who continue language through to the end of their studies. And university participation levels are so low that most modern language departments have had their staff severely culled and some have closed. These declines have occurred at a time when other nations' education policy has focused on language and bilingualism. It is, in fact, one of the requirements that those same employers who are asking for the four Cs also really, really want. They want bilingual employees. But the um, participation levels are incredibly low. Now, I've put this point in, uh, it's really not a detraction that Austra in Australia um, migrant students are actually raising the standards, not lowering them. That is a, that is a fact in educational statistics. But it says, it says more about our system than it does about um, the migrants. These are the results from PISA looking at scientific literacy and all students with a non-English speaking background are now outperforming the Australian students, oh, sorry, the, the English speaking background students. And we find this in various reports. 
The group that they now call um, uh, the majority group, which are the old Anglo-Saxon Australians, are performing particularly badly on educational indexes. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> you can't have quality education without quality teachers. This is a disturbing result and Australia ranks number one on one educational statistic here from the last PISA 2015 survey. Our principals, um, the highest proportion of principals um, reported teachers were not meeting students' needs. You'll see why in one moment. This practice in teacher education internationally and this is among the high achieving countries, needs to be both stable and have effective policies and mechanisms for it to work. Historically, we had that. Let's see what we have now. This is a graph of the ATAR emissions for teacher education programs. Uh, this is the majority group. There are about 38% of people who go on to become teachers get in through this pathway. At the top, we can see that there is dramatic growth in this do dotted line. That is the students entering without an ATAR recorded. The, the institutions are required to report to the Commonwealth Government, but they claim many of their students can go in without an ATAR. If you look to the bottom there, oh, to the very bottom, the blue right on the bottom, that is the lowest ATAR bracket, where the ATAR is 30 to 50, we can see over the last 10 years a trebling of the number of students moving in with that bracket. Now, ATAR is not a percentile rank. That is not the bottom uh, 30 to 50 percent. It is well below the bottom 30 percent. And there are a trebling of students who are getting into teacher education programs with incredibly low ATARs. The higher ATAR brackets in the yellow, you can see the yellow is the average student with an ATAR of 70. That's a 50 percentile is on 70 ATAR. So 50 percentile at the top there is quite a large group, but it's declining. So if we were getting our teachers from the top 50 percent, those numbers are going down and the students with a lower attainment are moving into the profession. Not only that, amongst the biggest group, we really know nothing about them. This is another way of looking at it. So I've got in blue the 2006 situation and then in black 2015. You can see the top of the distribution amongst the high ATARs has absolutely dropped. So we are not getting the high ability students. We really need to do that sophisticated work, the four C's, the relationship building, the getting inside of kids' heads. We're not getting kids who are academically strong and well prepared to enter the profession. Similarly, at the lower end of the bracket, below ATARs of 60, that's on the 40th percent, the bottom 40 percent, we are seeing a rapid increase in the admissions there. And I've written up some percentile brackets there. I think it is a common misconception amongst people that an ATAR is a percentile. It is not. I was wondering, well, if they're coming in with low, um, low uh, academic uh, attainment through the ATAR, and we know that there's lower participation in science and maths, what is the participation amongst science and maths amongst those going into teaching? And I did this research with Professor John Mack. We found that basically over the 10 years there was a tripling of those students going into teaching with no maths at all. <laughs> now, the, the regulation that you had to do at least one maths or science for HSC was removed in 2001 with the new HSC. Um, and since then, we've had this 15% growth of those going into teaching with no maths at all. Formerly, New South Wales had a requirement that um, primary teachers, at least, had to have general or intermediate maths to a band four.
but that was dropped when another range of policies also came in. So that there is now no requirement for primary teachers to do any maths, and we have growing numbers who are doing none at all. The declining one below, um, so that, that's the one starting from zero and going up to 15%. Up the top, we can see again that there is growth amongst the, the, um, the general maths cohort, so the entry level mathematics. And that growth is matched with the decline, which is a halving of the numbers doing two unit and a halving of the numbers doing three and four unit. And I ask, can we expect people with that background, and, and I mean, they've been failed by the education system themselves, can we expect to be seeing improvements in the attainment of children in schools when they are sent out to teach? The fifth reason I have, of course, I always have to stick the early childhood in there because basically, historically, Australia hasn't been particularly good at it. Up until recently, we had the lowest participation rates in preschool for, um, for amongst the OECD, but we've had a recent push and that has improved. We now have quite good participation rates for four-year-olds. The problem is the research all says that it's three-year-olds that really make the difference. Most other countries have near universal, most other European EU countries have near universal preschool attendance for years three and four, three and four year olds. But you can see on this graph here, which is, comes from the Nobel Prize winner, that if you're really careful about education and you look at where your investment dollar buys the biggest bang, it is really, really early on. In fact, if we run prenatal programs with parents and then parental education programs, we can see much better long-term outcomes from those than from secondary schooling. And that principle applies through to preschool and early childhood. In fact, across educational research, we see that there are actually growth, there is good growth in learning and returns from primary schooling, but in secondary schooling, it pretty well flatlines. In fact, we know that some kids go backwards. But if we were going to tackle our education woes, this is a very savvy place to, to do it. So what's the diagnosis? Well, these problems um, are only now really being acknowledged in the research, and a group of researchers tried to work out what was going on. They asked the experts. Um, the experts thought, first of all, that all of this stuff might be to do, to do with the Australian education schooling system. Too much tension between public, private and Catholic. Too much transitioning between those systems with the public systems being left residualised with, with students who are very disadvantaged and, you know, the other two systems creaming off the good students. When the researchers looked at the data for that, they found absolutely oh, no evidence for it. Similarly, that someone, one of the experts, quite surprising to me, decided that they thought it was the immigration that was causing the issue, um, that it might be um, immigrate, immigrant, uh, first, second generation, non-English speaking background students, and, well, you've already seen the data, there was no evidence for that. The third hypothesis they had was that we do have a problem with teaching, particularly in maths, and I think that is true. Um, and they thought that it might be the out of specialty teaching that was the issue, because across nationally, in classes years seven to 10, if you look at maths classes, 40% of students are sitting in a class with a teacher who's not qualified in maths, right? Now, that might be a problem. We also internationally spend very little time on maths and science, even in years seven to 10, and as you know, the participation rates for 11 and 12 are really, really low. There was some evidence to suggest that that was related to the declines that are being seen. If we are to consider 21st century learning, I would contest, oh, I should learn to spell it first. <laughs> That's right, you need to get your basic literacy first <laughs> and then your numeracy. And then, and the way to do that, because 
Well, you might say we've been doing that for ages, Rachel. Everybody's talking about literacy and numeracy. That's all we talk about. I'm sure, I'm sure Michael's sick of hearing people go on about literacy and numeracy and that plan. But the reality is, when we talk about literacy and numeracy and lap plan, we are always pointing downward on the schools, the principals, the teachers, the students, their parents and communities. My point here is, there are, we actually should be looking upwards. The system level structures, like admission to the teaching profession, are, um, are clearly not working, they're not effective, and they're setting up cycles where the higher education system through teacher education is feeding negatively back into schools. So, I like this one, it says it exactly. So we have, we have the subordinates here. You need to reform. That was then, and now is the subordinates saying to the seniors, you need to reform. We have had enough dabbling around in education with, and I have to agree with Mark Latham a little bit, too many fads, but um, often they're coming from de education departments. We really need to take a deep analytical dive and look at what's happening at education from, from early childhood, I would say even from birth, all the way through to higher ed. So the siloing of those systems means that we don't think about how they meet and how they, how they fit together. The current higher ed funding policy has driven universities to obviously recruit people into the teaching profession who are not prepared adequately for, with reasonable academic attainment. I mean, I know, what, I know what an ATAR less than 30 looks like on HSC papers. They are mostly non-attempt and there are no grammatical sentences. But we are seeing those sorts of students being offered places in universities because of the university funding system, uh, which Professor Simon Mardinson describes as a cash, a system in which students are cash cows. Now, my, I wanted to end on a slightly happy note. <laughs> my consolation here is that we are not alone. In fact, I think we are alone on the teacher education thing. I think that sets us apart. We are alone on the maths education thing. But on the declines more generally, it is being felt across Western democracies. And one of the uh, great educational researchers has, has sort of theorised that this is, that this is um, a, a kind of a syndrome known as the Global Education Reform Movement. You love the acronym. It's a germ. But that's another story for another day. You might note that Finland is a declining system, as is Sweden and Canada. Yeah. On this graph here, the declining systems are in that quadrant where Australia is. So they're, they're performing above average, so they're in the, on the right-hand side of average, those two quadrants. The bottom one is declining, the top one is improving. Can you see who's improving? It's a bit tricky. Germany has made rapid strides, as has Switzerland and Austria. Liechtenstein's improving. Japan has improved with a really soft touch educational reform, trying to reduce stress on their students. Uh, Korea is continuing to improve but has massive mental health problems. They have the highest youth suicide rate on the planet. And Hong Kong and China are also there. Um, uh, the, um, the veracity of that data is questionable by some researchers. But you can see that it is not universal, these declines that are being felt. There are ways that we can change policy to shift them. It's very, very important we do that, that we patch up the entry to teacher education, for example. This is why, because I, I have to end with my favourite, who's John Dewey. Yep. A government resting upon popular suffrage cannot be successful unless those who elect and who obey their governors are educated. We're not talking about skills for the 21st century. We are talking about democracy. And fundamental literacy and numeracy skills are at the absolute bedrock of it.
Since democratic society repudiates the principle of external authority, it must find a substitute in voluntary disposition and interest. And those can only be created through education. To do that and to rescue us from what is looking like a rather grim fate, I'm going to call it my own personal world of woe, a bit like Barnaby, um, we must interrogate some of the basic assumptions behind our educational system now. And we must redress those declines before it is too late. Excellent. Excellent.